Well, hello and welcome to the 27th Degree with Chris and Nancy. Today, we'll be discussing the brain with Dr. Mark Avicii, who's been on our show twice already. He's one of our, our favorite repeat guests. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Before we begin our conversation, I would like to thank our sponsors, Bay Coast Bank. Bay Coast Bank is just right for all of your financial needs. Visit baycoast.bank or call 508-678-7641 to learn more. And Duncan Hearing Healthcare. Hearing Healthcare you can trust with sites in Fall River, Dartmouth, Falmouth, and Centerville. For more information, visit their website, duncanhearing.com. As always, you can support the 27 Degree with Chris and Nancy by subscribing to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform, and by following us on Facebook and Instagram. Always please remember to leave a review, and of course, five-star reviews are greatly appreciated. Um, before we get going, I think, I think most of our audience knows you, but tell us a little bit about your background, and then we'll get right into uh, neurosurgery and the brain. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me back. It's always a pleasure, oh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, having a discussion Thank you. with you guys. Thank you. Uh, I um, am a neurosurgeon. I've been a neurosurgeon for 21 years. Uh, grew up in New Jersey, but then the rest of my training and career has been in the New England area, except for a uh, brief stint in training and residency in New York, where I learned how to be a neurosurgeon. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, glad, I'm excited to be talking about the brain. The last couple of times we talked about the spine, which tends to be more common, right. but for the most part, every neurosurgeon goes into neurosurgery in order to operate on the brain and, and see the brain. So it's a very, uh, I'm very excited to uh, talk about it. Well, we're, we're happy and excited to have you here too. And um, as far as the brain is concerned, what kinds of, what are the big categories of things you deal with as a neurosurgeon with the brain? Sure. So in neurosurgery, we deal with brain tumors, which is very common. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that's also very common is uh, brain bleeds. Mm -hmm. And those come in two flavors. You have the traumatic brain bleeds, so people who fall or are involved in some sort of trauma, car accidents and whatnot. And then people who actually have spontaneous brain, brain bleeds because of some um, malformation or abnormality within the brain. That okay. You know, an aneurysm or a... an aneurysm or actually the most common reason for brain bleeds is actually hypertension mm -hmm. so people will have as i don't have to tell you you're more of an expert in this than i am but as we get older if we do have hypertension and especially if it's not treated our blood vessels become stiffer right. less elastic and that means they're more likely to rupture with mm -hmm. each heartbeat and when it happens in the brain it can be quite devastating. Yeah. I always tell pa patients when they ask about hypertension, whether it's really that concerning, I, I say, think about it like this. Every time your heart beats, the blood is pumping and hitting those, that tissue, those end organs mm -hmm. with more force. And it does damage, of course. And that can result in, you know, brain bleeds, heart attacks, uh, kidney issues, so many vascular disease in general. Well, so. they don't call it the silent killer for nothing. That's right. And most patients don't have symptoms. And uh, most patients don't have symptoms until, you know, they show up in the emergency until room. Until they have symptoms. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> until they have symptoms. So people really should see their primary care physician right. and have their blood pressure right. checked. It's, there's probably nothing that's more important. Yeah, so true. Does the bleed the, the bleeds happen more with hypertension with people that are uncontrolled with their hypertension or Well, so this is the interesting part. So you're absolutely right. In people with uncontrolled hypertension, their risk of bleeds is very high. However, that being said, people with controlled hypertension have a higher rate of bleeds in their brain than people who have normal pressure. And I think, you know, a hundred years from now, they'll look at us and laugh and think about how primitive our treatments are. But hypertension is really not just a, a blood pressure disease, but probably a genetic disease. Mm -hmm. And there's something intrinsically wrong with either our, our genes or our connective tissues or our metabolism mm -hmm. that causes that. So even people who are taking their meds, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying, <laughs> I, I don't want anybody to get me wrong. Please right. take your right. high blood pressure meds because if it's untreated, the rate is much, much higher. But in people with treated hypertension, the risk of bleeding is still a little bit higher. Huh. So what are the symptoms? Like if someone has a bleed, what are they feeling? And then is it time sensitive for you to get to them to treat? Bleeding in the brain is always time sensitive. That's one of the things that if there's any suspicion, people should go to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of times there is no warning sign. 
uh, you were talking about aneurysms, which is a malformation in um, the arteries of the brain. And it, they call it a thunderclap headache. That's the, you know, sudden onset of the worst headache of your life. Right. And before that moment, you would never know. So That's scary. It really is. You know, I used to work in the ER as a quality manager, and one of the... Oh, one of the discussions we used to have with the ER physician group is to to screen for all this and to triage correctly when someone comes in. Mm -hmm. I mean, these people are coming in, oh, I'm dizzy, I have a headache. Mm -hmm. And it's like, <laughs> that's like 90% of the people who walk in there. So it's very hard sometimes to isolate and not call, you know, these certain codes for everyone that comes in with those complaints. So are there... Like, is there like a buzzword or is there something that, like, we always used to tell patients, you know, is this the worst headache you've ever had in your life? Mm -hmm. You know, because that makes a difference when you present at the ER. Because some people, like, they don't want to be a bother or they don't want to, like, make a big deal out of things. But, you know. Do we all have those stubborn grandfathers? Yeah, like, the Yankee I'm grandfathers. Yes, <laughs> yes. Be okay. But, you know, I think nothing really replaces common sense. And if you've had a, if you have a headache, if you have a history of headaches and you've had them before and you're having another one, then I, you probably don't need to go to the emergency right. room. But if you're having a horrible, excruciating headache, um, then you definitely should go to the emergency room. And that decision of, you know, who in the emergency room needs to get a uh, CAT scan, that's something a medical professional really needs to do. You have to be evaluated. You have to be analyzed. And I would just say, because, you know, you're looking at seven hour waits sometimes. So like when you go in, if you're having the worst headache of your life, please Let say those words. So you're not sitting out in the waiting room yeah. for yeah. seven hours Absolutely. with a headache. Absolutely. So yeah. the rule of thumb is really severity. If there's a severe headache, uh, that's not out of the word, that's not your usual or typical uh, let people know because emergency rooms do have these triage systems in effect so that not everybody, it's not the bakery, so it's not take a number and wait in line. Right. Unfortunately, our emergency rooms <clears throat> are packed and a lot of people they're do. They're overtaxed. Yeah. They're overtaxed and unfortunately some people do have to wait seven hours. But if there's a concern for a brain bleed, there are mechanisms in place to get you right to the front of the line and get that CAT scan right away. So that's the first step after they're seen by a physician, of course, and an exam is done is get an imaging study, a CAT scan to show if there's blood in the mm -hmm. in the brain tissue. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And then from there, you're called. And then whenever there's blood in the brain, a neurosurgeon's going to be contacted. Mm -hmm. And then it's a decision based on how healthy or ill the person looks and the size of the bleed. So some bleeds, when they become sizable, need to be removed no matter what. And others actually can be quite small and monitored. And if the blood pressure is controlled and the patient's stable and it's uh, the bleed is not very large, uh, we often monitor these patients in a in a closely monitored setting, something like an ICU or or what we call a step down unit. We keep a close eye on them with close mm, supervision by nursing and the intermediate staff. And Quite often, these people can be sort of nursed through their episode without the need for surgery. Mm. Do they have any, like, side effects afterwards from the bleed? So the brain has remarkable ability to recover. So a lot of times people recover fully and don't have any follow-up um, problems. Uh, the issue becomes twofold. That's not always the case. Right. So sometimes people <clears throat> will always have some permanent weakness, numbness, visual problem. And other t the, the other big issue is preventing the next one. So why did this happen, and how can you prevent the next one from coming? So someone comes in, they have a huge bleed. When you step in and you're, you, you look at their skin and you're like, oh, that's a big one. Yeah. Like, what are, you, what are you doing as a neurosurgeon, like, inside the operating suite? Right. Well, so I think before we get to the operating suite, you have to take things holistically. Okay. And so sometimes, unfortunately, if people have enormous devastating bleed, and we as a healthcare team 
don't feel that someone's really going to make a meaningful recovery if they're comatose and surgery is not going to reverse that, you have to ask yourself, why are you, you know, trying to be like right. Superman? Mm -hmm. uh, so that conversation needs to be had with the family. And then you have to take everything in context, right? So you have to look at how sick the person is and what are what are the goals of surgery. So obviously, we do everything we can to save someone's life. But if someone is, uh, and there's certainly no age limit, you know, there are okay. people who, there are people who are 97 <clears throat> and have brain right. surgery and do great. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there are some people who are, have made their wishes known that they don't want any heroic lot efforts. And if the healthcare team feels that there's, it's really heroic to try to intervene, then we may not go to the operating room. And mm. those, those directives on what we want, you know, at different stages in our life are very important. That's a very important conversation to have with our family because two o'clock in the emergency room is, is right. not a time because often people are not sure. Family members feel guilty because they feel they're right. pulling the plug on right. grandma. Right. Um, you know, shouldn't we, shouldn't we um, do everything we can to save our life? And that has to be taken in the context of you know, this is not having your tooth pulled. This is a major operation, right. a lot of intervention, a lot of pain and potentially suffering. And if you're not convinced that you're going to have a good outcome, yeah. then why are you doing it? And, and what would the patient have wanted is always the exact thing. And, you know, in, in every state in the United States, there's there are orders for life-sustaining treatment, mm -hmm. as you know, that are available. And in Massachusetts, it's the most. Mm -hmm. Um and I would recommend everyone out there, if you don't have one, um, fill it out with your physician so that they're aware of what you may want or not want to have done. Now, of course, if you're, you know, if you're a 20 year old, young, healthy person, you probably don't need that. But of course. I think as you get older, these are important things to, to fill out and to think about. And, and, and often patients don't like to discuss it, but, you know, it's truly important. And the other thing that you mentioned, which is crucially important to after filling out the form, you have to discuss it with your family yes. because they're going to be the ones that are making the decisions. And um, if they're not on board with what you want, then you there may be a decision made that's not necessarily what you would have wanted. So that's an important thing with the healthcare proxy. So the, I'm, we're going off a little well, bit. Well, no, I, I think I it's think it's important to important. talk about this for, for a second. So the... Um, the most in Massachusetts, which is the medical orders for life-sustaining treatment, is these are medical orders, but it's not a legal, um, these aren't, it's not legal in the sense of a healthcare proxy, meaning that it's a form, a static form that says what you wanted. We take those as medical orders until the healthcare proxy steps in. So once the healthcare proxy steps in, they can actually supersede the most and make a different decision based on the fact that they have more of a intimate knowledge perhaps of of what the patient may have wanted and things change over time and the the form that you filled out was done five years ago and maybe things changed over those five years so if the family's not on board and if you have a healthcare proxy that's not on board and does many times they don't even know they're the healthcare proxy this becomes a problem they're supposed to, you know, at least sign the form to recognize that they are the healthcare proxy. But we've had situations. I'm sure you're in the ER. You have too, where so, oh. a form is delivered, <clears throat> and you know, someone is picked as a healthcare proxy, and they really never discussed anything with the patient, and that's a problem. We used to have problems too with them not being updated. I mean, after divorce, right. you know, you have your ex-wife's name on your healthcare right. proxy. That could be so dangerous. That wasn't updated, or you have, <laughs> Pull the plug. you know, Pull the plug. Pull the plug. <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> one out of you have three children, you make one the healthcare proxy, right. and and then the other two don't agree. Yeah. So I think it's really important, as you said, to have those discussions, yeah. and, and then you're taking the guilt away too right. from your family. 
And then you find out if someone can be your health care proxy. Yeah. I don't have my husband as my health care proxy because not because he would kill me. Yeah, why is that? Can we talk about that? <laughs> no, it's because he, he told me I um yeah, you, yeah, I, I he told joking. me I would never be able to pull the plug on you, yeah. Nancy. And I'm like, Well, there are certain conditions that you would have to. Nancy, make me the health care proxy. I, I'll, I'll you know, I would it. have, but I feel like I'll outlive you. So <laughs> <laughs> I asked. I asked my brother, yeah, um, who okay. will have no problem pulling the plug on me. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so the the discussions, as Dr. Makavici said, ha- become very important right. because it's right. you know then decisions are coming from a place of knowledge, and the guilt's taken away. And it's important to do that before you're in a crisis mode because right. no one thinks clearly when they're in the middle of no. a crisis. And it's not what the healthcare proxy wants or thinks that you would have wanted. It's you know you are telling the healthcare right. proxy right. you know and these conditions please right you know and discuss all sorts of conditions right so the, the most once again those are medical orders but the healthcare proxy is a person who makes decisions in lieu of you if you are unable to make those decisions on your own so that actually can supersede the most and then i guess if there's really a if, if the healthcare providers feel there's a dramatic difference between what the healthcare proxy is is desiring and what they may know the patient would have wanted, then it becomes an ethical issue. But that gets very complicated. When we get involved, so just to to summarize, then mm-hmm. the the most is not binding, right? And I think no one wants to talk about, you know, their potential deaths and mm-hmm. you know how it. But it's a very very important conversation to have right. because when I get called to the emergency room and. More often than not, I don't know why these things happen this way, but it's always 2 a.m. on a Tuesday night, yeah. and you can't even reach all the family members, and all the family yeah. m- members have different opinions on right. what you know grandpa would have wanted. That's really not the ideal time to be right. discussing whether you're going to embark on major you know, brain surgery. Right. So I encourage everybody, just have that discussion. It's uncomfortable. But it, right. it can save a lot of heartache much later. Yeah, and preserve a lot of relationships down the road too. Of course, so you don't have siblings that have, uh, yeah. you know, relationship-ending uh, arguments. So families break up over this, you know, yeah. because one brother pulled the plug on mom, and yeah. how can you ever forgive him? Right. Um, if if everybody's clear on what you would want, then mm-hmm. um, it's very important. Yeah, and I think. You know, when you're facing these decisions as a family member, too, it's like, are you extending life or are you extending death? I, th- I think that's an important consideration when you're faced with a situation like this. Yeah. But when you're when you're looking at a bleed, do you pretty much yeah. when you're going in to operate, do you pretty much know what the outcome may be or? We have a very good. OK. It, with enough experience. Right. You have a very good idea nice. of how things are going to turn out. Okay. And you always get surprises. You know, yeah. we're not fortune tellers, but we always get surprises. But uh, for for the vast, that I would say 95% of the time, we know what our potential outcome is. Right. And we discuss that with the family. So you have to be honest and say, you know, I, I don't think this is going to end well. Um, that even if we do surgery, they may be severe and as you said, you know, if it's a if it's a twenty year old kid, you're going to do everything all the right. time to right. try to preserve whatever you can. Mm. Uh, first, because of their age, but second, not to be ageist about it, but younger people have re- enormous reserves right. of recovery. Right. Uh, um, whereas as we get older, those reserves get sort of right. tapped out, and and then if people have ha- may, had that discussion that, no, we want everything done, that she wanted to live life to the fullest, or she's already had a full life, um, mm. then then we make a decision whether to go or not to. And, yeah. and if we do, it it's, as I said, almost always time sensitive. You gotta yeah. do it right away. What's, what's dangerous about bleeding in, into your brain? Is it the, the pressure? That... The pressure. So the brain, if you have bleeding elsewhere in the body, Usually enough pressure forms in that organ to stop it, and we call that tamponade. Mm-hmm. You know, that just means there's enough pressure in that space to stop the bleeding. Okay. The problem in the brain is if you get to that pressure, the brain's not working any longer. So there's severe brain damage. So 
the point of surgery and why we operate on bleeds is to get rid of the pressure. Hmm. That's actually true for true tumors as well. We, we want right. to get rid of the pressure. How do you get rid of the blood? So what we do is we make a cut in the scalp, and then we make a window in the bone uh, right over where the bleeding is. Uh, and then we find the blood and suck it out. Um, and we just use suction to evacuate the blood. And quite often, the biggest challenge in these operations is stopping the bleeding. Right. So we have various techniques, and sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes you can be there for several hours. And we stop the bleeding and allow the brain to relax. Sometimes there's been so much injury mm -hmm. because of the blood that the brain itself is swollen. And now the brain is putting pressure. Yeah. Sometimes we actually have to remove some of the brain just to relieve the pressure. Um, then we take that window of bone and reattach it and close up the scalp. Mm -hmm. If there's so much swelling that we think we can't safely replace the bone, sometimes we actually leave the bone out. So when someone whacks their head, mm -hmm. like they might not have an enormous amount of bleeding right away. So is there like a, a common time frame that you're really on the watch for? Oh boy, you had a no. good bang yesterday, no. like today is the day. No, it, it varies. So there are some sort of bleeds and this is what happened to, um, I forget his name, the actor's wife. Skiing. Skiing. Yes. And she hit her head and she was fine. She was fine. And then she collapsed a few hours later. We call that the lucid interval. Mm. And she collapsed. And then by the time they got her to the hospital, the bleed was too big and she mm. passed. Right, right. Um, Liam Neeson. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, um, and that's, and then there are some people, nowadays our doctors are putting everybody on blood thinners into a neurosurgeon. Right, right. right. The most hated medicine in the world. And I'm not saying Imagine. stop your blood thinners, but from our side, we only see right. what goes wrong. We never see the benefits of it. Right. We only see what's wrong right. with it. Right. So people can hit their head months down the line, and then they hit their head, and they start just a small, tiny leak. And two months later, mm. they come in, and they have what we call one of these chronic bleeds. Um, and it's over two months. It's right. accumulated, and it's a tiny, tiny leak um, that's occurred. And a lot of times, people don't even remember hitting their head or yeah. it may have been an, an innocuous injury. We deal with this in the nursing home all the time. I mean, a day does not go by that someone doesn't f fall and hit their head pretty yes. much. And a lot of those patients are on blood thinners and most of them get sent in for a CAT scan yep. because it's very hard to evaluate and, and rule out a bleed otherwise. Exactly. Are you at a disadvantage with a chronic bleed, like with the little bleeds, or is it kind of treated Actually, this you're sort way? of at an advantage. Because it happens slowly, the brain sort of compensates. Oh, that makes so sense. So the chronic bleeds can actually be quite sizable and only show minimal effect, whereas the acute bleeds, the ones that happen suddenly, mm. those, you know, it's, it's hard to compensate. Exactly. Our bodies are incredible. They were designed, it, the design of our bodies is just amazing. Definitely amazing. It is hard, hard to sometimes believe how much blood could or fluid can be in someone's head, right. and they're up and talking and walking. And <clears throat> they have a little numbness in one. What's hand. the most you've evacuated from someone? I don't know. I've never, I've never really measured it, but but you know, the size of a orange, you know, I mean, just incredible, <laughs> large amount. That's of that's blood. a huge amount of blood. Huge amount of blood. If you consider the brain as a right. closed space, they're trying right. to shove a orange into someone's head. Yeah. Um, but if you do it over the course of a couple of months, uh, it happens. Is the, the blood itself toxic to the brain tissue or is it more the pressure that it's producing? So in the acute setting, it's the just the blood itself. Mm -hmm. But in those chronic settings, the blood itself actually breaks down into its component products. You know, it it becomes like an old, uh, like old blood. If you look at a bruise mm. and it always turns colors over yeah. time. Right. That's the blood breaking down under your skin. The same thing happens in our head. And those breakdown products could can actually cause fluid, inflammation, swelling, and stuff like that. So mm. it's not just a space. I Good. can't imagine operating on someone's brain. Like, thank God there's people like you who can actually just be like, yeah, I operated on a brain today. You know, like, that's like 
blows my mind. Yeah. It's sort of magical, and it's actually the reason I got into um, the reason I got into neurosurgery was just being able to look and operate on the brain. I I actually was on track to become a, a lung doctor, a pulmonologist, like Dr. Koshikaro. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, my mother was a pulmonologist, and I wanted to be a pulmonologist. I did research in pulmonology. I was just down that road, and and then I got a chance to go to um, to rotate in medical school on neurosurgery, and it just blew That's my wild. mind, literally. Yeah. I'm always amazed when you hear these stories about um, people having, say, surgery for, let's say, epilepsy surgery, and they're awake during it. Mm-hmm. It's kind of fascinating. Well, what's you can, you can do these surgeries with people conscious. So that's actually <clears throat> not becoming more common. It's becoming less common because of the monitoring ability that we have. So if you go back to the early stages of neurosurgery, more surgery was done awake because it was the only way to monitor the brain, right? Hmm. So before we had all the monitoring capabilities we have today, <laughs> uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, when brain surgery first started becoming a uh, a science in itself. Mm-hmm. Um, people used surgeons used to operate on people awake, um, and that was um, commonplace. And you you shouldn't be surprised because the brain itself has no pain yeah, fibers. No fibers yeah. So if you numb up the skin, the rest can be done awake. People don't have pain. You can never do abdominal surgery without right. anesthesia because people would just not be able to tolerate the pain, but the brain has no pain fibers. So the only way to make sure that you weren't touching something sensitive. Nowadays, the monitoring is so incredibly capable. You know if you're operating around sensation for the arm or Mm -hmm. movement of the leg or or vision. The only thing that we really can't monitor today is speech. So if you're operating Mm -hmm. near the speech area, we still do do those operations awake. Okay. And because the only way to know if you're affecting speech area is to ask right. the patient to speak. Right. Now, it's interesting that, and, and I've always known this too, that the brain has no pain sensation, but when someone has a bleed, they have a headache. Yes. So. Because that's the pressure on the meninges. On the, the meninges. Lining. The lining. That's what I so figured. The, the yeah. pressure on the meninges causes headaches, and that sudden pressure causes severe headache. We were talking about those chronic bleeds, the ones mm. that develop over two months. Those people never have pain. Those people always come in right. with some sort of usually innocuous symptom, like I have numbness in my hand, mm. and someone gets a CAT scan. Or It's fascinating. It really absolutely. Now, you talked about tumors, too, causing pressure. So what are the most common tumors that you deal with? Well, the brain is the brain gets a lot of blood flow, and because of that, people with cancer elsewhere in the body often will have metastases to the brain. So the most common type of brain tumor is actually metastasis. So that's why it's important for people with cancer to be monitored and stay um, in touch with your oncologist. And they do what's quite often what's called staging to make sure that they do everything possible to prevent it from going to the brain. When metastases do go to the brain, people do very well with surgery. We know that they have better quality of life and longer lives if they have those metastases removed. And and nowadays, the techniques for removing those are dramatically improved. Um, And then you have what we call the primary brain tumors, and those are the tumors that actually grow from the brain. And the most common one is a tumor called glioblastoma or glioma. Um, This has affected a lot of people Mm -hmm. in the news. Um, uh, I think Joe Biden's son... Had this. I believe that's true. And John McCain uh, had this. It's true. Yeah. It's very common. I think also Ted Kennedy. So it's a very, very common uh, brain tumor. And unfortunately, uh, really devastating. It's yeah. inoperable, isn't it? It is operable. It's People operable. do better when it's operated on, if you can operate on it. Um, but quite often it's in an area that you can't reach or would cause a permanent um, uh, effect. So when we operate, we do offer people improved length and quality of life, but it's usually very aggressive and, yeah. uh, and not something. Uh, 
it's a hard one to cure in many instances. It's really almost impossible to cure. There, there are, I actually have patients who are five and 10 years out, but those are exceedingly rare. Mm. Primacare is Southeastern New England's trusted leader in medical care. With offices in Fall River and surrounding communities, we're dedicated to your well-being. Our carefully selected team of more than 150 providers offers world-class primary and specialty medical care. Primacare doctors are supported by a skilled staff trained to deliver comprehensive radiology, imaging, and testing services. Primacare is large enough to take care of all your medical needs, but small enough to care for you personally. Primacare is by your side. Are there types of tumors that you watch for in families or or not? It, yes, but not the, it's very uncommon, very uncommon. So if you have a relative who has had a brain tumor, um, it's much it's very unlikely for someone in their family to have a brain tumor. Mm. Um, unlike families who which can have aneurysms, uh, vascular malformation. So if you have, two first degree relatives who've had aneurysms, the rest of the family should be screened for aneurysms because people can... So two first degree relatives? Two first degree relatives. So mom and dad or mom and brother or mom or sibling. But I get this all the time, you know, my grandfather had it and my, you know, great aunt or my aunt, That's that really doesn't increase the risk necessarily. No, right now, so those studies are still ongoing. As you can imagine, they're hard to do. Yeah. It's hard to trace people so far, you know, several generations mm -hmm. back. Right now, the recommendations, if they're two first-degree relatives, then all the other first-degree relatives in that family should be, should be screened. Uh, screened. But otherwise, screening for aneurysms is not always beneficial. And how often do you screen? That's always a question that comes up. You do it, you do a scan and it's negative. When do you do your next one? So if it's negative, you never do another one. Okay. Because you Fair don't. Enough you don't grow aneurysms. Mm -hmm. What happens is quite often we'll find a small one and then what do you do about it? And it creates a lot of anxiety. Right. So if it's small, we'll follow it. Um, if it's more sizable, then you know you may want to consider treating it. And what sizable is, is usually in the you know five to seven millimeter range. If it's smaller than that, it's actually hard to treat. It's hard to actually mm -hmm. obliterate it. And there's there's a number of ways to treat it. I mean, there's also interventional radiology that mm -hmm. can be involved. And in. absolutely, well, so interestingly enough, um, no matter how you treat the aneurysm, whether you do it with open surgery or whether you do it with, uh, maybe we should back up and just talk about aneurysms and describe yeah, what they are. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. So an aneurysm is, I don't know, you know, nowadays tires are so good. This never happens. But if right. you ever look at, I always compared it to old tires. And if you're old like us, yeah, you get a little blowout on the side of the yeah, tire. Yeah, it's a little little... blister on the side of the yeah. tire. Yeah, you remember those? Look at a Mac. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's a little blister yeah. on a blood vessel, right. on an artery, which is a high pressure system in our, unlike the veins. And the danger of that blister is it could rupture. So an aneurysm by itself, if it's unruptured, doesn't cause any problems. But if it uh, ruptures, that's where the danger comes in because it could be life-threatening. And it creates a lot of anxiety. People who have aneurysms feel like they have a time bomb taking yeah, in their head. Of course. And so the traditional ways to repair it were to operate, meaning you know, open a hole in the head and find that little blister and put a little metal clip on it, sealing it, mm -hmm. preventing any blood from entering it. And that, as you can imagine, your surgery. First, the, there were two issues. One is the surgery itself, and then always was the danger that when you clip it, you may crimp one of the nearby arteries. And if that happened, then you know you could potentially, through surgery, um, give someone a stroke. Not very common, but certainly a, one of the risks of that operation. I am old enough... I'm embarrassed to say that I, I re, when I trained, that was the way the majority of aneurysms were treated. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, they're treated like many heart conditions with a catheter placed in the groin. They take a um, catheter that winds its way all the way up to the brain, and they have these tiny little metal spools that we call coils, mm -hmm. and they actually fill the aneurysm, that blister, 
they fill it up from the inside. And if you fill it up from the inside with metal coils, blood can't get into it, and it doesn't have a risk of rupture. Now, the vast majority of aneurysms are treated that way. It has much lower risk. Um, it's much more controlled. It's much less invasive. Um, either way, the procedure is most likely going to be done by a neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. Although interventional radiologists put coils in other parts of the body, in the liver. and the, Not so much in the brain. Not so much in okay. the brain. Good to know. So uh, our vascular neurosurgical colleagues um, do both the open and the what we call endovascular coiling. It, that must be extra training then beyond a, a general yeah, vascular surgery. Yeah, vascular surgery. training is... So as neurosurgeons, we're all trained to do everything, but then we always have areas of specialty and expertise, and the, um, the vascular training is... You know, although we're all trained to do it, having a vascular training and vascular fellowship is really preferred. And, and nowadays, if you're going to have a vascular procedure, if you're going to have an aneurysm clipped, should probably go to a vascular center. Um, these procedures, although we're doing more and more advanced neurosurgery in the community, <clears throat> vascular, I think, is one of these things that really should be done in academic mm -hmm. centers where people have a lot of experience doing this. And that's not to say there aren't community hospitals that are doing this. There are many with well-trained and well-equipped, but it's not typical. Do the coils last forever? Forever and ever. Thank God, huh? Mm, that you yeah. have to get one replaced. Do they endothelialize? Is there exactly so this tissue that grows over it? So at some point, that coil is not even exposed to blood flow. Exactly right. right. Exactly right. And the the goal is if the if you fill up the aneurysm perfectly, and the endothelium, the lining of the blood vessel, forms around that, then you should just have the the normal artery without any irregularity. Nice. And uh, and the techniques for doing that because one of the dangers in the past was well what if you put in if you put in too few coils and blood still gets in the aneurysm it right. could grow or burst. Mm. And if you put in too many it could block the um, the artery that's mm. the origin of this. But nowadays they have so many techniques with things like they put a little balloon in there like angioplasty and they smush the coils a little bit to open up the techniques now for treating this are phenomenal. There must be so much investigation you have to do before you do a procedure like that. Absolutely. I'm, I'm guessing with any brain surgery, of course, but this in particular sounds so intricate. It is very intricate, but the, the technology nowadays is, I, this is not something I'm a specialist in, mm. but when I look at my colleagues, they, the, the 3D, you know, you think about, three-dimensional reconstructions and AI and people with the fancy glasses. Um, that's relatively new in certain industries, but the 3D reconstructions of the vasculature of the brain has been around for 20 years. So this is really sort of the tip of the spear of, of hmm. medical technology, if, if, you, if you'll take that metaphor. So in, in Fall River, it, this, this day and age, we can do a lot. Mm -hmm. What can you do as a neurosurgeon with the brain, and what can't you do here? What is preferably referred out? You mentioned already about vascular procedures on aneurysms. So here in Fall River, we can pretty much do anything except probably the most complicated brain tumors, mm -hmm. um, vascular, and pediatrics. Okay, pediatrics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't really have a, a very advanced pediatric ICU to take care of neurosurgical kids. Right. So, right. but... A lot of, uh, as I had mentioned, you know, va vascular neurosurgery is an exception, mm -hmm. but the technology has spread out from the academic centers and the amount of things that we can do now in terms of brain tumors. We have guidance and imaging and monitoring um, that's equal to a lot of the medical centers. That's great. Yeah. I want to come back and talk about tumors again just a little bit. So when you're when you're getting ready to operate on a tumor, I mean, sometimes I'm or maybe the majority of the time, you're coordinating care with an oncologist. Um, so when is it ideal, or is this really case by case driven? When is it ideal to have the tumor be shrunk first with chemotherapy? Mm -hmm. um, 
And, you know, do does the chemo then uh, affect anything on your end? Does it make it trickier if they've had chemo or? Or radiation for that. So, radi- so if someone's had radiation to an area, it's always harder to operate because mm-hmm. the, the blood vessels are a little bit more sensitive and fragile. Mm-hmm. And there's always scar tissue <clears throat> in that area. That's mm-hmm. one of the side effects of radiation. Chemotherapy really doesn't affect us except okay. in the terms of Chemotherapy can affect healing, uh-huh. and uh, there are also um, chemotherapy used to be just simply designed to poison the tumor. Right. Right. But the newer chemotherapeutics use the immune system, and sometimes they attack the blood vessels. Right. Mm-hmm. So for a tumor to grow, it uh, ha- it needs more blood, more and more blood. So tumors, one of the things tumors can do is recruit Mm -hmm. blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And there are some chemotherapies that block that. Well, you can't have that around the time of surgery because it poisons the body's ability to heal. Mm -hmm. So we have to work closely with oncologists of most people on chemotherapies, whether it's blocking blood vessels, modulating the immune system, or poisoning tumors, have a schedule. And so you have to incorporate surgery around that schedule. And sometimes that can just be stopped and resumed after the surgery is healed. And other times, you just sort of uh, insert yourself in between the breaks or something. So that communication between the oncologist and the surgeon is critically important. But luckily, we have a great relationship and are always working to try to find the best solution. So what's what concerns you the most, like the size of the tumor or how involved it is with everything that surrounds it? So in neurosurgery, we like to say we are just like uh, real estate agents, location, location, location. Okay. Okay. So a giant tumor that's in not a sensitive part of the brain um, doesn't bother us that much. What really bothers us is the what we call the eloquent, the very sensitive parts of the brain where something the size of a pea could be devastating. Yeah. And, mm. and you know, unfortunately, like like in the brainstem, sometimes something the size of a sesame seed uh, could be devastated and not be treatable. Right. Like going after like something like that, you would create more damage than you would relieve. So it's really location, location, location. doesn't matter the size of the house. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's a good way to look at it. What's the difference between a cyst and a tumor? So a cyst can be benign or malignant. A cyst is just basically a sac of fluid. Okay. So sometimes there can be an injury to the brain, and the response to it uh, is to create a cyst. Sometimes you can have infections. Now, we don't see this very much in this country, but in other parts of the world, right. people have parasitic inf- infections, and the body's way of dealing with that is to wall it off and then that that walled off area mm. turns into uh, it fills with fluid and becomes a cyst so it could be infectious it could be related to a prior injury so if there's an injury or sometimes even a stroke um, you can have a cyst that forms in that area and then you can have tumors that um, secrete fluid uh, and then you have a tumor cyst and some of those actually are extremely challenging to operate on because it's like operating on a plastic bag. The minute you enter the cyst, it deflates. And now it's hard to tell what's tumor and what's normal brain, and you're just operating on a crumpled plastic bag. If you're in an area where you can take a little margin of brain, then um, you do that in order to try to get everything out. In other times, you know, if you're afraid of injuring or damaging something, if it's close to an area that's eloquent, then you have to be a little bit more judicious and also um, potentially risk leaving something behind. So sometimes you hear, sometimes I hear, because you're the one telling this, I guess, um, that we're just going to watch it. There's nothing that we're going to do right now. Mm -hmm. So maybe the child or the young adult is like, okay, so I'm going to be walking around with this in my head. Mm-hmm. Like, what can't I do or what shouldn't I do? Like, I guess I'm not going to go out and play football mm-hmm. or do anything that's going to have contact. Right. So contact it really depends on what it is. Mm-hmm. A lot of people have benign brain tumors and just 
walk around with them. Kind of meningioma. Yeah, exactly. Which is really more a meningeal issue, right? But yeah, but we, we we call them brain tumors. Exactly. Not really. So we still we still. So a meningioma is a benign tumor of the meninges, usually benign, uh, although they can be malignant. Uh, but it's a benign tumor of the meninges, the lining of the brain, the part of the brain, the part of the head that causes pain when we were talking about yeah. hemorrhage. And a meningioma is very, very common. About 10% of us have it. Okay. And we wouldn't even know it. Yeah. And they're usually very slow growing if they grow at all. And people can have them for years or decades. And what I tell people is to forget about it. Yeah. Obviously, they should be assessed by a neurosurgeon. Obviously, they should be. I don't mean to ignore it. But if it's been deemed to be stable and small and not affecting anything, you can have a brain tumor and live with it your entire life and never be bothered by it. Nice. When you say location, 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 do we know everything that the brain does and where everything is? So, In, in rough brush strokes, yes. Okay. So we know where communication and language and coordination and vision are. The really intricate minutia, um, we have a long, long way to go. We're really in our... Like she said, 50 years from now, they'll laugh at us. Yes. They'll look back. Absolutely. My God, they were so yes. archaic. And Absolutely. Just like we think about medicine in the 1800s. And Absolutely. Absolutely. And I really think that the brain... It, it, what's amazing to me as a surgeon who's been doing this for 21 years is how much things have changed. Mm. And that's just in my short career. I can only imagine what they'll be doing in 100 years. It yeah. Just, it would be fantastic. It's amazing how things are progressing in medicine. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're kind of in the golden age right now. It is. So many new things that are coming forward. It is. It's hard to even understand how it can advance so quickly, but it is. It is. And it's really now starting to almost exceed uh, physicians' ability. So a lot of specialties, you see this in cardiology, you see this in uh, different areas, even in neurosurgery. It's now fragmenting into different right. specialties because it's right. hard to keep up with right. all the advancements. Right. right, just like cardiology, you have the electrophysiologist <clears throat> who deals with the electrical part of the heart, and then you have the interventionalist who's doing cardiac catheterizations, and the general cardiologist who might deal with, uh, you know, risk stratification, stress testing, cholesterol management, hypertension. It's they they really have. It, it's separated into different fields. The imaging, the imaging, imaging right. specialized in imaging. Um, I, I, I don't think it'll be long before neurosurgery splits. You know, especially certain fields like uh, vascular and pediatrics um, really are. But you have functional and you have spine, and it's it. As mm -hmm. I said, it's hard to keep up and do everything right and do it well. It's just amazing. To operate on a child's brain, there's there's so much that has to go into that because it's developing, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. absolutely. And you have to you have to really consider you know the the implications of what you're doing, but and um, hey. it, very very few things can be as rewarding you know than helping a sick kid. But sure. a lot of these kids have chronic issues. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I've seen surgeons sort of grow up in their career as the kids have grown up with them, uh, yeah. because it's uh, it's usually one of those long term relationships. What's one of the advancements that has happened during your career where it was just like, wow, oh my god, and you got like really excited about it? Wow, there's so many. Um, I'd have to say one of the most amazing things now is the. Um, um, the guidance. So when I was a resident, they had come out with like the first guidance system. So by guidance, what I mean is it's really like GPS for the brain. So before guidance, what you did was you did a CAT scan or an MRI. You looked at it. You looked at the patient's head. You took your best guess of where to cut. And you cut, then you know you made the cut a little bit bigger just because you didn't want to miss anything, and you made the window in the bone a little bit bigger because you didn't want to miss anything. And then, if if there was a problem on the surface, you were really sort of relieved because then, as soon as you removed the skull, you would see the pro what the problem is. But if the problem was 
like an inch underneath the surface of the brain, mm. or the most anxiety producing is if it's several inches deep. Mm -hmm. Wow, that would be just so anxiety producing of like, because right. even if you're off by a little bit, you know, if instead of going directly right. this way, you're off by a little bit, you can miss and you're in someone's right. brain. And it's right. very, very, um, you know, you as a surgeon, you're anxious and you can imagine what that means to the patient right. who's undergoing the procedure. When was the first brain surgery done? When was it? Mm -hmm. So brain surgery was originally Inches. done by the Incas. The okay. Incas. We have, we have, we know from their skeletons that they've had um, holes in their skull made and that they survived it because we can show, we can see that the, the holes healed. Mm. Um, but they really didn't enter the brain and stuff like that. Brain surgery was, has been attempted uh, for centuries, but mm. the mortality from brain surgery was over 90%. Uh, a lot of things, a lot of things not related to the brain, like things like infections and stuff like that. So the father of neurosurgery uh, is a physician by the name of Harvey Cushion, who made the greatest advances in the 1940s, 50s. And Harvey Cushing actually got a Pulitzer Prize for a uh, history he wrote of another giant in the history of medicine, William Olsler. Okay. So he was not only the father of neurosurgery, but he also got a Pulitzer Prize for his writing ability, which is sort of stunning. And he dropped the mortality from, he, he reversed it on its head. So the mortality from neurosurgery used to be 90%. And by the time he had ended his career, the mortality from neurosurgery was less than 10%. That's amazing. And then he actually trained the next generations of neurosurgeons. So uh, us as neurosurgeons, we can actually trace our education and our lineage, our pedigree, if you will, to Harvey Cushing because the person who trained me was trained by one of Harvey Cushing's students. So I'm only three generations removed wow. from Harvey Cushing. Mm -hmm. So, And we all, you know, have learned that way. That's amazing. It is sort of amazing. So um, yeah. anybody who's interested in the history of medicine, um, read about Harvey Cushing, an extraordinary person, extraordinary. Interesting. Related to the Cushing's disease, Cushing, or? Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, the epon eponymous um, was, disease. Was that him or was that another? No, Cushing? it was him. It was him. It was him. Oh, Cushing's disease. And, uh, one of the other places you can get a brain tumor is well, the pituitary gland. Mm. And the pituitary gland is often called the master gland. And it's this little sort of like appendix-like structure that dangles behind our eyes off of the bottom of the brain. And abnormalities of it can cause abnormalities in our hormone endocrine system. So it can cause problems in menstruation. It can cause problems in lactation. It can cause people to become giants. And mm. giantism and acromegaly can result from pituitary tumor. Andre the Giant. Andre the Giant. Yeah. I remember him. Uh, blindness can come from that. And Cushing's disease, which is mm. a um, disease of too much cortisone production, mm. uh, all controlled by the pituitary. Yeah. It's an amazing little gland, isn't it? It is amazing. And people have made careers just studying that. Absolutely. Wow, we covered quite a bit today. I loved this talk. I think, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Yeah, <laughs> but we maybe talk, part two. Maybe part two. We we could do a part two. But just to summarize, we talked about bleeds. Mm -hmm. We talked. We took a little left turn. We talked about advanced directives. We talked about the moles. We talked about. Um, uh, um, what are we trying to say here? Healthcare uh, proxies. Healthcare uh, proxies. Yes. Then we went into head trauma. Yep. And then we talked about tumors. We, we covered quite a bit of ground. And we just, ground. we just scratched the surface, of course. Just the surface. But it was really fascinating. And I'm sure that our, our viewers will have learned a lot and will have I appreciate so. this. I always appreciate it. It's always a wonderful discussion. So thank you for inviting me back. Oh, thank you so thank much you. for coming back. We appreciate it. And maybe we will have a part two. We'll see how it goes. But um, thanks again for being here. We greatly appreciate it. Um, and I want to uh, once again mention our uh, supporters, uh, Bacos Bank. Just right for all of your financial needs, visit bacos.bank or call 508-678-7641 to learn more. Duncan Hearing Healthcare, hearing healthcare you can trust with sites in Fall River, Dartmouth, 
Falmouth and Centerville. For more information, visit their website, duncanhearing.com. And for all of you, thank you for watching or listening to our show. If you'd like to become a sponsor, please contact us at 774-319-4230. Special thanks to Ron Gamash for our intro music and the bio skills of Northeast for producing our show. Before you go, is there one message you want to leave the audience? One thing you'd like to say? Uh, I think probably the most thing, important thing that we uh, discussed today was those advanced directives. We know it's very important. Uh, we deal with this every day as yeah. physicians. Um, and But if you look at the statistics uh, statewide and nationwide, we're not really keeping up. It's a very difficult conversation to have, but it's also very important. Critically important. Absolutely. So true. And, you know, you mentioned an important thing about how as we get older, we have less reserve. This often happens. You'll have someone who's in their 80s and they they don't want to address it because they're just so vibrant and healthy. Mm -hmm. But when you get to a certain age, you don't have a lot of reserve. So it doesn't take much to kind of flip over to a situation where you're not vibrant anymore. And and so it's important. It, it's really important for, I think, everyone to think about these things. But certainly when you get to a particular age or if you have health issues that may be potentially life-limiting, you know, talk to your doctor about this and get the forms filled out. And, and, and then, of course, talk to your family about what your desires are. That's and to, important. to family members for children and, and um, other family members who will are caring for someone who's maybe a little bit more elderly. Mm. What my experience has been, and tell me if it's been yours as well, that once you start the discussion, mm. people are actually not shy about it. They're they're almost happy to talk about it and yeah. say, "Oh no, this is what I would want. Don't I don't right. want to be on machines. I don't want to be." Yeah. You know, That's what I found. Uh, you know, I think it's changed a lot. I think um, years ago, I used to run into more people who were hesitant to talk about it, and I think nowadays uh, patients they 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 seem more empowered and more able to talk about this. So I, I don't know what this shift has been in society, mm -hmm. but I very rarely now bring up the, the conversation, have someone say, I, I don't want to talk about it. Whereas, you know, I think years ago that would happen once in a while. Sure. Uh, but yeah, people do talk about it now more freely, which is great, I think. Mm -hmm. um, how do people reach you? So I'm available through um, the Hawthorne Medical Associates, my, okay. uh, my medical group that I'm part of, but also affiliated with the Steward program. Uh, and uh, we have one number, one easy number to reach us. It's 508-996-3991. Uh, uh, or you can find us online through uh, through Steward or through Hawthorne Medical Associates. Right. And of course, the primary can always refer to. And Absolutely. Dr. Markovici, once again, thank you very much. Thank you very really much. Really appreciate your expertise, taking the time to be on our show and educate us and our viewers. Thanks again. And thanks, everyone, once again, for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.